This is a poster from 1926, pitching London's underground as the best place to, um, not burn alive in a horrible fire, apparently. At the time, it was a pretty fair pitch. In the early 1900s, the subway platforms in the London Underground would remain around 14 degrees Celsius or 57 degrees Fahrenheit year-round, which is pretty much the ambient temperature of the Earth. But then something weird started to happen, particularly on London's central line. Year after year, the temperature inside the tunnels would get a little bit hotter than the year before. And before you call me a soy boy, lib boy, science boy, and slam your laptop shut, no, this is not one of my preachy climate change videos. Climate change is when stuff heats up here. This is about stuff heating up here. It's an engineering problem, and it's a pretty big one. These days, the temperature inside the central line regularly breaks 30 degrees Celsius or 86 Fahrenheit, which, as articles on this subject love to point out, is technically above the legal limit for transporting most farm animals. So in short, this tunnel is hot, and it's only getting hotter. But why? Well, the question of why the central line is so hot is really the question of why the central line can't be cooled down. You see, any subway system is going to generate heat, and a lot of it. These pesky heat molecules come from a couple of different places, but they mostly come from the trains themselves. You see, trains generate a lot of friction starting and breaking over and over again, and this friction gets converted into heat, which gets trapped in the tunnels, yada yada yada, we all learn this in friction class. But somewhat unique to London's underground, only about 45% of the underground is actually underground. And you'd think that would make it easier to cool the trains down, but you'd think wrong. When the trains go above ground, particularly during warmer, sunnier months, they absorb a lot of solar radiation and carry it right back underground where it gets trapped and converted into British sweat. So okay, subway tunnels get hot. But as I mentioned before, most subway systems around the world are not so hot that bringing a pig on them constitutes two different crimes. And that's because most subway lines have a way to get rid of this heat, while the central line does not. But to explain why, we need to talk about the way that the central line was built. You see, London's underground has two different kinds of tunnels. Subsurface tunnels, like the Circle Line and the Metropolitan Line, and deep tube tunnels, like this video's protagonist, the Central Line. Now, the subsurface tunnels were built earlier, and to this day, they still don't have any problem venting heat. When these lines were dug under London, they were designed around steam power trains, which meant that they needed plenty of ventilation in order to not poach the trains in their own train juices. But when the first deep tube tunnels were dug in the 1890s, this wasn't a concern. The trains running through these tunnels would be powered, for the very first time, by electricity, which in the 1890s was like saying these trains would be powered by magic. And the engineers were like, these magic trains sure are great! They don't emit smoke or steam or anything, so let's just make these tunnels as small as possible and dig as few ventilation shafts as we possibly can, because apparently ventilation shafts frighten horses, and horses are a thing that will definitely outlast this metro line, so let's all go to the pub and have whatever terrible beer is available to drink in the current year, 1890. I might be paraphrasing a little bit, but that's basically what they said. Now, in fairness to Yole engineers who didn't foresee their tunnels gradually heating up to pig roasting temperatures over the course of 13 decades, these lines were originally entirely underground, and that would have ultimately kept them a whole lot cooler than they are now. So let's talk solutions, and because I'm in a bit of a mood, let's talk about why most of these solutions won't work. As an American, my first impulse when I see something that's too hot is to strap an AC on it. But unlike some of the underground's other lines, which do have air-conditioned trains, the central line can't fit AC units on their trains because the tunnels are hardly big enough for the trains themselves. And even if you could design AC systems to fit on these trains, which they do plan to do by 2030, it's actually going to make the problem way worse. Ironically, air-conditioned trains tend to generate even more heat, since cooling down the inside of the cars means expelling hot air into the tunnels. This is one of the bigger cooling problems that the New York City subway faces, for example. So don't worry, Londoners, you're safe from the scourge of air-conditioned travel for at least another decade. The other somewhat obvious solution is to just dig more ventilation shafts. That's what they did on the other deep tube tunnels, like the Jubilee. You know, just because the central line was designed before scientists had invented friction doesn't mean we can't go back and fix their mistakes. Except it kind of does, actually. The Central Line's other big problem is that it's, well, central. It's right under some of the busiest and most developed parts of the city, and Nando's has a strict policy against venting boiling subway fumes into the middle of their restaurant. Now, there have been some mitigating measures put in place, or at least pitched, like solar reflective paint, brakes that absorb the energy that they generate, and air conditioning individual stations while just hoping that trains don't ever get stuck in the actual tunnels long enough to bake everyone on board alive. But the fact remains that the trains are still generating a lot of heat, and about 79% of that heat is still getting absorbed into the clay surrounding the tunnels, and I don't know if anyone has realized this yet, but this might turn into a giant infrastructure problem if London were to, say, endure a massive heat wave. Um, I'm not sure how to end this video. This is just a bad thing. 
It's just a thing that's bad and true. So there you go, information. On the bright side, the day is about six minutes closer to being over. But if I haven't wasted enough of your time, don't worry, I figured out how to waste more of it. How? With a little thing I like to call four original documentaries produced by me and my team available right now on the educational creator-owned streaming service Nebula. You've got the world's most useful airport, the story of an international airport on a remote island in the middle of the Atlantic, the final years of Metro, our documentary we filmed in the sinking Marshall Islands, Alaska Silent Summer, our coverage of a small town's tourist economy in the midst of a pandemic, and finally the Colorado Problem, our most recent feature-length project about America's Colorado River and its dire, drier future. All of these documentaries are available alongside so much other amazing exclusive content from your favorite educational creators, like Real Life Lore's Modern Conflict series and Real Engineering's Battle of Britain. Nebula allows us to create the content that we truly want to create without having to worry about going viral or appeasing an algorithm, and the cheapest way for you to get access to this content is with the CuriosityStream Nebula bundle. It's less than $15 for an entire year, and also gets you all the other awesome documentaries and shows available on CuriosityStream. All you have to do is follow our link, curiositystream.com slash HAI, or click the button on screen to sign up, and you'll be supporting HAI while you're at it.